for our speakers. And uh, so we're live streaming. We're just sorting out the technical glitches. Um, we're starting a little bit later than the program had intended. So I'm going to ask the speakers really to keep to time. And um, I'll be keeping an eye on the time. So let's, let's start it off. The first panel is going to be about how ceramics can contribute to a resilient carbon neutral Europe. And the second panel is about ceramics essential contribution to other industries in reaching those same goals. So first I'd like to invite uh, Alain Delcourt. He's the president of Ceramuni. I know that many of you will know him and he's going to present to us the new ceramics roadmap which is being officially launched uh, today. So Alain, over to you. Thank you. It's my pleasure and I would say my honor to present this new ceramic roadmap. Um, this is the second uh, roadmap we, we, we prepare and this one is a, I dare say, a, a masterpiece. Uh, it's a piece of art because this is the result of a very extensive work, especially uh, collecting all data about processes of our heterogeneous sector. Um, to be able not only to deliver, let's say, a wishful thinking document, but really a working document trying to give uh, an image uh, as synthetic and as clear as possible of our uh, industries, industry and industries, um, but also to see and uh, evidence uh, and, and highlight how our various processes, approaches, and product can uh, uh, contribute to this uh, Green Deal uh, package and fit for uh, 55. Uh, I'm not going to disclose everything in this roadmap. I don't want to spoil your pleasure. Um, I just want to, to go very quickly uh, through, through it to the main, uh, main chapters. Um, and invite you to use, read it, and use it, and reuse it again and again, because I think this is really a very good support document for uh, our further communication uh, approaches. I will start by, by giving, uh, in a nutshell, uh, a few numbers about the ceramic industry. We all know them, but it's never useless to, to, to remind. Um, it's a pan-European perspective. We have um, 30 member countries. We are essentially uh, made of SMEs. 80% of our members are SMEs. Uh, we are uh, a motto for growth because the, the, the production value is uh, more than 26 billion euros. Um, we are export driven. We are, some of our companies are really export champions and the total positive uh, trade balance we contribute for more than 5 billion euros, which is not bad. We are sensitive we are energy intensive not so intensive compared to other some other industries but nevertheless energy intensive and uh, really sensitive to energy prices which is a very hot topic these days because up to 30 percent of our costs are related to energy we are a job provider because we provide more than 200,000 uh, direct jobs and close to 400,000 uh, indirect jobs altogether in the 27 countries Europe. And being SMEs mostly, we are talking about local jobs, uh, sometime in a remote area, not being offensive, uh, not being uh, negative, uh, really heavily embedded, let's say, in the, in the territories. Um, and Last but not least, uh, we have most of our product, if not all of them, are very durable product. Uh, because the average lifespan, for example, of a rick house is 150 years, but we all have example of uh, houses that are much, much, much older than that, uh, not to mention other products. A word about ETS. I say we are energy intensive, but not that much, because uh, we represent 10% of the total number of installations in the DTS, but we represent only 1% of the total emissions. So we are, each factory by itself is a small emitter. And I think this is not to be forgotten. Hmm? Okay, uh, this is quickly. How does 
ceramic uh, fit into this, this, this green deal and can contribute to this, to this, uh, this approach and this ambitious program. Um, you can find ceramics everywhere, in your, in your, every day in your life. You live surrounded by ceramics. Your house is full of ceramics. When you eat, you eat in ceramics. When you drive a car, it's full of ceramics. When you use your mobile phone, there's a ceramics inside. When you see a windmill, there is ceramics inside. When you take a plane, there's a ceramic inside. Your computer, everywhere. It's hidden most of the time, but it's there everywhere. It's an inherent part of our life in all aspects. And uh, if I start by the most, perhaps most visible one, which is construction and housing, uh, the number of examples, I will not go through everything, but from bricks to expanded clay to wall tiles to drainage pipes to roof, everything, paving, sanitary wear, everything is ceramics. They are very durable products. Hmm? And uh, <coughs> uh, they, they can play a very, very important role in renovation because the renovation of existing building stocks and focusing in uh, um, near zero energy buildings are paramount to meeting European decarbonization objectives. Uh, ceramic construction uh, material, sorry, ceramic construction material are durable, affordable, which is extremely important, and provide comfortable, energy efficient, safe, and healthy houses for millions of people in Europe. If we have a, a look at the consumer goods, I already said something. You find ceramic in household appliance, tableware, uh, growing uh, household, and jewelry, and everything. Essential ceramics. If we go to the more so-called technical ceramics, uh, they can play an important role in the open strategy autonomy and resilience of European economy. For example, refractories, thanks to their outstanding properties, uh, heat resistance, keep their shape in very difficult environment and everything, are absolutely key uh, to a number of processes. Without refractories, no steel, no glass, uh, no aluminium, no, no whatever. So it's, it's, it's really important. And they're also an enabling product that is, is, is providing a, a, a superior efficiency in the various processes. It's, it's really inherent part of the processes. If we look at what we call the, the technical high-tech ceramics, um, well, clearly uh, no electronic with all these products, uh, used in, uh, in medical thing, used in the superconductors, uh, electronics and batteries, we talk about electrification of uh, mobility and everything without ceramics, no electrical car, for example, no batteries. Uh, we find that in uh, renewable energy, windmills, we have uh, ceramics in it, solar cells, everything. So they really play a, a, a critical role in, in all of this. And this is, this is a common factor to our product. When we had a few years ago uh, this study, we, even ourselves were really surprised to see that to see how many sectors were, we were involved in uh, with, the, with, with, the, with the ceramics product. Pardon? Two minutes, okay, I have to speed up. Yes, our industry committed to European climate ambition. We have achieved more significant CO2 reduction before the 90s, uh, when we phased out of coal and uh, heavy fuels. We have reduced our emissions since the year 2000 by 45%, so the, the, the biggest progress are behind us already. We, we reached the first roadmap in, uh, in 2012, and we had foreseen a possible reduction by 68% at the time. You will see that the new roadmap shows what climate neutrality means for us, what technologies and decarbonized energy are required, what abatement costs are necessary, and what are the policy requirements and conditionalities needed. We have, then I will run short of time, but we have the, the, the CO2 mix. This is a very, there is a very extensive uh, data gathering. And we have uh, uh, worked out an emission reduction model. So this is really a working document. This is not just wishful thinking, like I was saying. Uh, we have listed a number of technologies, some of them more or less mature, some of them not yet ready, not yet available, that, and have identified the, the respective role of these various technologies could play in the future in our decarbonization project. I will not list them, you will find them, we will have plenty of time. 
we have, as you can see here, uh, this is explanation of that. And uh, the pathway for a carbon reduction uh, road is by the horizon 2050, we ended up with 1.3% emission, which is near zero. We could have played with the number to make a nice zero, but we prefer to be uh, stick to, the, to, to, to reality. This could be easily compensated by other actions. And you will see the different role. Clearly, electricity is playing a prominent role, but biogas and hydrogen, whenever available, uh, will also play an important role together with, uh, with a less, to a less extent, with the carbon capture and uh, uh, processes. Conditionalities. This is very important. Zero emission technologies have to be available in the short term because our investment cycles are 20, 30, 40 years. So to be ready by 2050, we need in the next years to make really uh, uh, important choices and uh, options. So we have to have visibility about the availability of the technologies and the product and the cost. We need to have sufficient availability of alternative fuels and equal access for all sectors. Removal of technical regulatory barriers, a gradual decarbonization of electricity, otherwise we just shift the problem. Gradual availability as acceptance of uh, CCS, and a continuous and sufficient carbon leakage protection as long as necessary, because we have to undergo uh, very drastic changes and be vulnerable during this, this, this period. A carbon price incentivizing investment and not subject to speculation, this was discussed yesterday. And stable supply of decarbonized energy at competitive price, otherwise it's a no-go. Um, I think I finish here, I'm almost on time. Uh, sorry, I have taken shortcuts, but uh, I could not uh, explain and spoil uh, what you will find in the roadmap. Thank you for your attention. That's about the roadmap. It's also applicable to ceramics. Use it, reuse it, and use it again. So I would want to check that everybody in the back can hear us OK. Can you give me a thumbs up at the back if, you, if you're good with sound? Yeah, thank you. And let's invite our next uh, speaker, Vincent Bastillo from the European Commission. Vincent is policy officer in DG Grow, but he has 30 years experience before the commission in the construction materials sector. So you're not one of those young boys that joined the European Commission straight out of college, are you? You've got lots of experience that you bring and share with us today. So, uh, Vincent, I think you have some slides that we need to uh, get, uh, get teed up, is that right? Do we have slides for uh, Monsieur Basrio? Yeah, that's coming. And then, uh, Vincent, you have 10 minutes, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, the uh, representatives of the European uh, ceramics industries and colleagues. It's a pleasure for me to, 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 to answer to this uh, invitation to present uh, about uh, what are the different uh, policy initiatives which could concern the energy intensive industries such as the ceramic industry. Next slide, please. Okay. Problem with slides? Next slide. Okay, not too big. Okay, perfect. Okay, where does we 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 we, we come from? Of course, uh, climate uh, climate policies are quite a long story and a continuous falling ball. But let uh, me mention the European Green Deal, of course, which was a. With the, the, the key policy initiative for the uh, new commissions in, in 2019. And uh, this uh, European Green Deal, of course, it's a matter of transforming the EU into a fair and prosperous society uh, with a modern, resource efficient, and competitive economy. And on top of that, of course, as it has been announced, the objective is to make the EU the first climate neutral continent in 2050. And we expect that other parts of the world will follow us on this path. Uh, and to do so, uh, later on in 2019, September 2019, we had this reduce, uh, reducing carbon emissions by 50, 50, 50, 50%, 55% in 2030 objective. Next slide, please. 
So we have also a very important milestone in this policy development, which is the industrial strategy for Europe, of course, which is of great concern for our DG, DG Growth, which deals with uh, industry, enterprise, and SMEs. Uh, and uh, our unit, which is uh, following the energy intensive industries and raw material, we are absolutely uh, involved, committed, and concerned by the fact that energy intensive industries are absolutely indispensable to Europe's economy. And a lot of sectors, maybe all of the sectors, economic sectors, uh, do rely on, the, the, on uh, energy intensive industries, products or services. And of course, due to this uh, such high level of CO2 emissions from this sector, maybe through the energy production, but also through, through process emissions, uh, the, uh, it's uh, very important to decarbonize this, uh, this energy industry, energy intensive industries. Uh, and this goes through modernization of quite a lot of uh, subsectors. To reduce uh, the, this industrial emissions, uh, for, of course, first is uh, energy efficiency first principle, uh, which is something which is also already in development. And uh, President Delcourt has mentioned how high was uh, the, the achievement by the ceramic industry since uh, 1990. And it's a very good example. It's also how to, we can secure sufficient supply of low carbon energy at competitive price. And a few seconds before, President Delco mentioned absolutely the same in his conclusion. For that, we have to plan investments in low carbon technologies, capacity, and infrastructures. This is how we can modernize these energy intensive industries. Let me mention, of course, this update in uh, March 2021 20, uh, this year. Uh, due to mostly due to the, 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 the breakthrough of this uh, COVID crisis and uh, the, 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 the pregnancy of a need for increasing resilience of EU industrial ecosystems. And we, we all of us know that uh, the raw material issues was uh, security was uh, is still a big issue and uh, it's a key uh, for the achievement of uh, our the objective of the European Green Deal. It's also how we can accelerate sustainable and digital modernization of all industrial ecosystems. And this is part of building the resilience of the EU economy. Next slide, please. It has been mentioned, I saw it's very well reported in uh, the, the, the ceramic roadmap, the climate law, uh, which was released uh, last September 2020, with this new objective of emissions reduction uh, of 55% by 2030, which is absolutely ambitious and uh, challenging. And for that, a uh, climate plan has been delivered for the 2030. The objective is to steer long-term investments, to invite all of the financial community, co community to, to, to invest in industrial ecosystems, so renewables energy, in, uh, energy-intensive industries, uh, mobility, the built environment, and food and digital industries. Member states, stakeholders, commission also uh, uh, are committed to develop together transition pathways, which should be the, the, the practical, I would say, the, the common sense, as it was mentioned yesterday by uh, Dr. Scheuch, the common sense uh, contribution to achieve climate sustainability and with a resilience objective. You see how, with this graph, uh, this chart, how we, 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 we intend to, to achieve this, uh, this, uh, this objective. Next slide, please. The package to reach the 2030, which was also known uh, under the name of Fit for 55, and released in July uh, 2021, with 13 legislative proposals to deliver on the targets of the uh, European Green Deal, it should consist in a stable regulatory framework for greenhouse gas emission reductions and a just and socially fair transitions of the economy of, of the EU economy. It's based on the, uh, the objective of strengthening and extending the EU uh, uh, ETS, uh, ETS system uh, in order to increase the innovation fund which should fund, of course, the transition and the, the modernization of the, uh, of, the, of the economy and uh, specifically the industry. It's also, it mentioned also 
the, the, the introduction of, a, of this uh, EU carbon border adjustment mechanism. And in the first, uh, first uh, phase, it will concern iron and steel industry, the cement sector, fer fertilizers, aluminum, and electricities, which are at the top of the, uh, the most uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, emitters uh, sectors, emitting sectors. One objective is also to amend the renewable and so ongoing work, uh, amending the re renewable energy uh, directive uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to achieve this uh, target of 40% of renewable energy, the certification and quotas uh, uh, process for renewable uh, hydrogen in industry and transport. All of that should be uh, key signal and stable signals for uh, investors. Uh, of course, all of that could take place if there are markets for sustainable, circular, and low carbon products. It's absolutely essential. From my point of view, we should start from the, the, down, the, the, the downstream, how we can assure that uh, the market is ready to accept and how we have to accompany it through market-based instrument, uh, the acceptance, the, the adoption uh, of uh, market, uh, sustainable circular and low carbon products by consumers, uh, pub mass public, uh, mass, uh, mass consumptions, but also industrial consumption. This goes through certification labels, sustainable product initiatives, corporate governance, public procurement. We know it's essential in terms of leading example, leading by example, rules, guidelines, green claims, initiatives. Next slide, please. To, to develop this work, we have released in September this year a staff working document, which is there to, 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 to develop scenarios towards, towards the co-creation of transition pathway for the energy intensive industries ecosystem. It establishes a vision towards 2030 with the needs and tools to support the twin transition and strengthening its resilience. It's based on the master plan that's been mentioned by Titas, my colleague Titas, yesterday. And the master plan, it's an essential document which has been developed by the EII subsectors and the ceramic industries as deeply contributed to this, uh, the, to, the, to, to this document, this master plan for competitive transformation of EU energy intensive industries to enable it as a, a climate neutral circular economy by 2050. It focuses, of course, on reskilling and measures ensuring a just transition, which is absolutely essential because we touch uh, a key basin uh, of employment and works uh, in many, many areas in the EU. In this staff working document, if you go through, you will find a lot of key questions for stakeholders, key questions for you, and if this is a, a part of a public consultation which is open until the 22nd of this, uh, of this month. Next slide, please. So what are the transition challenges for the EIIs? Honestly, I've already seen that they are all written in this document, the uh, ceramic industries uh, roadmap. It has been clearly mentioned by, uh, by uh, Dr. Scheuch yesterday too. Uh, we need, uh, there is a need for a supportive framework uh, from the EU, the national, regional, and local authorities, and a commitment from industrial and stakeholders towards a common vision, which means that it's a continuous work. It's not a matter of just publishing a document or this and that, not a, a new regulation or even a roadmap. It's a continuous follow-up and continuous commitment to implement all of that. It's, of course, a matter of finance for innovation and investments in decarbonized projects. Without finance, no money, no action. So there won't be projects if, they don't, if there is no, 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 no sufficient finance for that. It's a matter of access to energy and infrastructures. So it means simultaneous development of energy, clean energy production and also distribution infrastructures you have perfectly identified that. It's a matter of availability of decarbonized electricity at affordable price, decarbonized energy carriers, renewable electricity, clean hydrogen and biomass, renewable heat, heat sources, clean hydrogen, carbon capture, utilization and storage. You have mentioned that, uh, President Delcourt, dedicated hydrogen infrastructures, either newly built, repurposed from existing natural gas infrastructures and so on. 
and of course, upgraded digital infrastructures, which will be essential for this tra transformation through 5 or 6G, Earth observation data, and cloud, uh, cloud edge uh, computing. Of course, all of that will go through uh, an energy intensive industry's workforce, uh, and we have to, uh, to cope with a deep challenge for, uh, for, for this workforce. We have aging workforce in these industries, and we, have, we, have a, we face with a lack of attractive, attractiveness. Uh, and these new products and new processes will mean new skills for digitalization, data analysis, robotics, resource efficiency, recycling, business, uh, business uh, process, which means plenty of new opportunities for young generations. And uh, I'm sure that, as I've done 40 years ago, uh, new, 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 new people will go into the service sectors. Next slide, please. Transition pathways, it's a matter of developing actionable plan, uh, actionable plan for the transition of these industrial ecosystems, taking into account the scale, cost, long-term benefits, and conditions of a twin transition. I have in mind the conditionality uh, slide from President Abeko. That will be through building blocks with different, uh, different items, position, vision, and so on. I'll let you read that. The, you, what would be the inputs? That will be the economic analysis fishes which have been done in the past years, the digital compass, and the fit for 55 targets already published. Industrial technology roadmaps from the, the, sub, the stakeholders, experts from the, from the industry itself. This is what you have published today. And of course, it's, uh, the priorities are uh, focused on ecosystems in urgent, urgent need for transition due to the fact that they are uh, uh, in, a, in, in competitive, competitive uh, uh, challenging positions and also they are great, uh, great, uh, great uh, emission emitters, as I already said. Next slide, please. At the end of the day, what would be my, uh, my, my words? The ceramic sector is a key enabler of climate neutrality. So traditionally key in providing solutions for the EIIs, but it's all, as it has been said, tradition, but also uh, modernity through heat resistance, uh, heat resistance ceramics, specialized industrial products in many sectors, as you've mentioned before. It's also a very important export-oriented industry for, our, for, for the EU economy uh, in 30, 30 countries, and uh, which means that we must maintain excellence and competitiveness for this sector. So this strategic sector, it's a strategic sector in green transition going forward, and your industry roadmap is there to de demonstrate it. And the current 2030 regulatory framework should be the EU's toolbox to facilitate this green and digital transition of industry. We need to scale up private investments with public supports in essential, uh, is essential to decarbonize EIIs and for avoiding the lock-in of high emission infrastructures and assets. Final word, this, uh, this map, it's a complex, uh, next slide please. It's a complex map of a different most relevant initiative, but it's just for, as a reminder for you where you see what can be uh, uh, highlighted in order to, 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 to get support from the, uh, from the EU. Thank you very much and congratulations for this, uh, the, this uh, new roadmap for the uh, EU ceramics industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. It's a lot of different policy initiatives to have to explain to us, and you did a great job of going around all of those things. And the next panel is going to be on uh, ceramics being a key enabler, so we'll come back to that point about uh, climate neutrality, so thank you. Our next speaker is actually joining us um, on the uh, video stream, so we probably just need to make a few small adjustments there. Um, we're joined by uh, Mr. Yorgo Chachimakakis, who was a uh, member of the European Parliament for 10 years. He's a German MEP, he was a German MEP, now Secretary General of the Hydrogen, um, European Hydrogen uh, Organization, Hydrogen Europe. Uh, Yorgo, I, I think you can see me, you probably can't see, we have a room full of people that are very interested to hear from you, and I give you uh, the, the word for 10 minutes. Uh, Excellent. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks very much indeed for the invitation and uh, my warm congratulations to Alain Delcourt for the presentation of uh, the roadmap. Uh, we had a 
look at it. We prepared also uh, this uh, meeting today uh, with uh, your team. And I have to say, I'm really thrilled. Um, it is a very, very important document um, for an association like ours, because we need to know the demands on uh, clean energy of the different sectors. And uh, there are hardly any sectors that have done it uh, the, the really the, 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 the special way you did it. Uh, and we are, of course, pleased to see, and you showed this chart already, Alain, uh, that the demand on hydrogen is equal in 2050 to the demand on uh, green electricity. So that's a very good start. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, not only renewable hydrogen, but also, and you mentioned it, uh, synthetic gas based on hydrogen and also biomass, biomethane, will play a role here. And um, how we look upon hydrogen, how we look upon the different um, definitions on hydrogen will be of utmost importance for industries like yours uh, in order to uh, catch up, in order to get the amount of hydrogen uh, that you need. Uh, but also hydrogen for you uh, and, and part of your industry, the ceramic industry, uh, might be also a very good business case, but I'll come back later uh, to that. Uh, it's also in your, in your roadmap and it's very, very important. It's also very important. Now, you all have witnessed what happened uh, uh, last year. The pandemic broke out and we had already on our tables the European Green Deal proposal and also um, the idea of a climate law, the idea of Europe becoming the first climate neutral continent in the world. But the pandemic put a lot of people under pressure because um, we saw that the energy demand dropped dramatically. And there were many people saying, there's no time now for a green deal. And I have to um, congratulate the commission this time um, that uh, especially uh, Franz Timmermans, the executive vice president took a clear decision. He said, there is a way to decarbonize without to deindustrialize. And uh, so he really took hydrogen on uh, and within uh, three months after the outbreak of the pandemic, um, or four months, we had the hydrogen strategy uh, that was presented last year in uh, July 2020. At the same time, uh, Commissioner Breton initiated the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance that, by the way, at the moment has 100 times as many members as the Battery Alliance. Why? Because, and this is not a competition, this is to show that uh, hydrogen is, covers a broad uh, field of the production of hydrogen, the dissemination, but also the use in different sectors. One of the sector, and you mentioned it uh, already, of course, is the heating, because you need a lot of energy for heating. Uh, another is, of course, transport. The third one is the use uh, in industry as a feedstock uh, and uh, uh, in buildings. Uh, so uh, here I would like to, re to make already one remark because we see in the Fit for 55 package that certain sectors might have less access to hydrogen. Take heating. Uh, we see a certain reluctancy in uh, not in DG Grow, but in other parts of the commission to understand that basically everybody should have the right to hydrogen. Uh, we should not exclude sectors beforehand. Often this is done with the argument of efficiency, which is also one um, important part of the Fit for 55 package. But what is efficiency? Is it that you have high yield uh, of uh, electricity demand uh, of a panel here, and then you use it in a battery car because it's the, the highest efficiency? Would the same panel that is installed in Brussels on a roof, would it yield the same amount of electricity in southern Spain? Of course not. It would deliver, it would yield much more uh, energy. And here's the point. We can dispatch molecules, hydrogen that is produced in the south of Spain, we can dispatch them and we can bring them to Brussels and all the way bring them here, the efficiency loss will be approximately 
the same like the efficiency that is much lower of the panel installed here in Brussels and used for the car. So we can see already and with this example that the term efficiency needs to be seen in a system and we need to have system efficiency aspects and cost efficiency aspects included to that, uh, not to forget also rare earths and uh, critical raw material and minerals. And here, hydrogen indeed has something to offer. Uh, so after the strategy and the alliance were proposed last year, this year, uh, the, the fifth for 55 package with the 13 legislative proposals was bold. It's the biggest impact on our legislation since the introduction of the internal market, 3,000 pages and 1,000 mentionings of hydrogen. So that, that clarifies already that hydrogen has, from a science fiction technology in a niche, has become one of the central pillars of the energy transition, which at the same time is also an industry transition, mobility and heating transition. Um, and we are now in the midst of uh, preparing ourselves for the next legislative uh, proposal, which will come in December. Uh, it was previously called the third gas package. The current name of this uh, proposal uh, foreseen for the 14th of December is a hydrogen and decarbonized gases package. And this needs to be seen also in combination with um, the Fit for 55, where we have a definition on renewable hydrogen, renewably produced hydrogen. We can expect in this hydrogen package also a clear definition on other hydrogen forms, uh, especially uh, we need to see um, uh, clean hydrogen as a no carbon hydrogen and also minus carbon hydrogen, which stems from biomass, especially produced on seaside with algae and not on the land side. And uh, we are preparing for exactly that. At the same time, also um, considerable amounts of money have been, uh, have been put aside for hydrogen projects. Last night, only the ETS Innovation Fund has published the first recipients of, um, uh, of uh, this uh, important fund to reduce, to mitigate climate effects. Uh, and hydrogen is prominently mentioned there, even in combination with CCS carbon capture sequestration technologies. Now, this funds that we are preparing now for um, need somehow to be managed. So first of all, this change from uh, horsepower to car, so that what we see now from coal, oil, and certainly also gas to hydrogen and biomethane and green electricity, it costs. Uh, and that is why we need uh, to relax state aid rules, at least for a while. We foresee for that kickoff phase that started already a timeline until 25. As of 25 to 35, we will see first elements of market formation. We will see also, we call it the ramp up phase. We can see already a digression of state aid because the price of hydrogen will fall considerably. Um, we also see that the best element to do that is not only to uh, support CAPEX, that's what the ETS Innovation Fund does mainly, uh, but also OPEX. In OPEX, we uh, see supported mainly by the carbon contract for difference approach. This is the best way to help your industries to levelize uh, the, the costs uh, that you have additionally when using hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives uh, instead of carbon or other fossil energy carriers. Uh, we are preparing for a switchboard that does exactly that. We need to know the amount of hydrogen that are needed. And this also will um, include an importation strategy because uh, mentioned already, South of Europe is, is better placed for solar, um, North of Europe better for wind. And globally, there are countries that will produce hydrogen for a low price. And here, in, an importation strategy will play a very, very important role. We are preparing for auctions, for global auctions, to uh, match the demand with the production. And at the same time, this switch board will not only auction, but also um, it will levelize the cost with a carbon contract for difference. Now, let me come to one uh, special element that the ceramic industry also entails. There are fuel cells. So fuel cells are um, the, uh, the, the technology that help to make out of hydrogen 
uh, and oxygen from the air, again, electricity uh, and water uh, and heat. So these um, fuel cells uh, normally are produced with stainless steel or with ceramics. Uh, we see a considerable market, especially for stationary fuel cells, that are fuel cells that are installed in houses to produce heating and electricity based on, yes, uh, hydrogen backbones, hydrogen pipelines. And here there's a specific market that is also foreseen in your roadmap um, that builds on this hydrogen technologies. Uh, and we are looking into that. We know that some of our members uh, work uh, very clearly and have already first products here. Uh, that's a very, very promising uh, thing. And it brings also, uh, I know this is important for DG Grow, the competitiveness of Europe much in advance. So uh, it helps us to become more competitive. There are, of course, bottlenecks. Uh, there are um, some ideas that we do not understand also in the Fit for 55 approach. 80% of this, congratulations again uh, to the commission, are good. So we will not have so many amendments that we propose. However, the additionality principle, which we fully support, so to have more additional renewable capacity when you use this electricity that you produce, for hydrogen is absolutely clear, nobody doubts, but as it looks at the moment, the delegated act foresees a mechanism whereby you need to prove the additional additionality every 15 minutes, one five. That's not good. Uh, that's is, uh, definitely uh, a show stopper uh, and we need to remove this idea because it doesn't make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, shift happens. And this shift happens in many, many industries. I'm really glad uh, to say this um, uh, also to Alain uh, and um, to your association that we uh, are started a, a close collaboration. Uh, we are happy to deliver. We are happy to uh, co cooperate closely with you. And we wish uh, this workshop, we wish uh, our collaboration all success. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Marcus, joining us there on the video. You'll stay with us, I hope, for the panel discussion. If you can just uh, give us another 10 minutes or so, then we'll be back to the panel. Thank you. Uh, so we've heard about policy. We've heard about um, energy. We've heard from Alain what the ceramic industry is proposing to do about all of this. And our next speaker, Luc Triangle, is going to talk to us about the people. He's the General Secretary of Industry All, the European Trade Union. Um, and the just transition is a big part of this transition that Jorgo was just, uh, just talking about. So, Luc, over yeah. to you. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, first of all, um, to you all to invite us also at this uh, important workshop. And indeed, uh, I prepared a whole speech, uh, including also the policy framework, including also the technological uh, challenges ahead of us. But I'm not going to do that because actually most, most of it has already been said by the previous speaker. So I'm not going to be uh, repeating that part. Uh, indeed, uh, I will bring in the social dimension. Uh, it has already been touched on a little bit when we talk about skills uh, and when we talk about the needs for training and upskilling and so on. And this is indeed going to be a challenge. But I'll come back to that point. Um, I think we have to understand that what we are facing now and um, the Green Deal uh, objectives uh, are going to be for the European industry the most challenging transformation in more than a century. So we have never seen that before. Uh, and the challenges ahead of us are enormous. Um, and it is certainly also, a, and it's most, first of all, a technological debate. Are we going to have the technologies? Are we going to have the clean energy available? Are we going to meet the future challenges of electricity uh, in comparison with what we have now? Are we going to meet them by 2050? Will this electricity be green? And so on and so forth. This has all been said, and I think in the uh, presentation by Alain on the con condi conditionalities, uh, a lot of what has been put there, we fully support. And I would like to congratulate you, Alain, with this excellent report, because it's very readable, it's concrete, and it's, um, yeah, it's not too much um, uh, in, in, into the details, but it's indeed concise. But as I said, I would like to go into the um, social dimension. We are organizing all workers in industry and manufacturing. So that means also those in extractive industries, 
going from black coal um, uh, to uh, oil, gas, but also in the renewable uh, energy, also in hydrogen ac uh, activities in a number of countries already. We also organize the energy intensive industry, steel, steel uh, chemicals, non-ferrous, ceramics, glass, and so on, and also the automotive industry. Our estimates are that about 25 million workers' jobs will be affected by this Green Deal. Um, 25 million means not all job losses, let's be clear. Uh, it means jobs will change, competences will change, competences that we have today will not be needed anymore tomorrow, and we need tomorrow new competences that we don't have today. But we know that, that we are going to have a need to have new competences. But unfortunately, also jobs will disappear. Uh, that's clear in a number of sectors, um, and that's already happening now. Uh, I'm now going a little bit outside the ceramics. We are see already in the supply chain of the automotive sector today in a number of countries the first closures of companies in southern Europe supplying in the automotive sector on the internal combustion engines. The first closures are taking place. And I'm sorry, is there a just transition taking place? Nothing, nada, okay? <laughs> Nothing is happening, people are getting unemployed. That's the reality of just transition today, yeah? Um, so um, there will be new jobs created. Uh, we all know the numbers, the macro numbers that have been launched in the run-up to the Green Deal, in the run-up to the climate law and so on, about so many million new jobs will be created. Who am I not to believe this, uh, these numbers? But what counts for us is not the macro number overall in the European Union, but what counts for us is the micro solution for this individual worker uh, in that individual company that is losing his job or her job. What solution do we have for this person there? These people are not served with macro numbers uh, at European level about new created jobs and so on. So for the moment we are still here in the Brussels bubble talking about optimism, about the social challenges. And let me quote um, as well the Commissioner President, uh, but also the Executive Vice President Frans Timmermans, who said repeatedly that the Green Deal has to be first and foremost a social deal. These are not my words, these are the words from the Commission. They understand that the social dimension is going to be key in order to succeed as EU uh, also, and also to politically survive as EU, and I'll come back to that point. Yeah? Because if we fail socially, we will have a political problem. And I'll come back to that point at the end. So in that sense, um, we need to be sure, and we are clear as Industrial Europe, we fully support with whatever we have available the objectives of the Green Deal. Because this is the way forward for the European industry. We need to decarbonize, we need to take the lead, because if we take the lead, we are competitive. Yeah? And we show the way forward also for other uh, large economies in the world. Uh, and um, decarbonization, has said before, cannot be the same as deindustrialization. So we need to make sure that industry, every industry, including steel, including um, chemical industries, have a future in Europe. So in that sense, taking protective measures against unfair competition from outside the EU towards the EU are crucial. The carbon adjustment mechanism has been mentioned. It's going to be crucial to safeguard our European industry that we have today against, um, and to protect them against uh, unfair competition. So all these things that have already been mentioned today, we fully support, and I'm not going into the detail given the time. So let me focus a little bit on the, um, on the social dimension. Um, I, I must say that um, what we hear, and um, we are going beyond the ceramic sector, that's what I said in the beginning, we, ha we hear a lot of concerns. Um, we just organized um, our Just Transition mobilization campaign over the last three weeks, and I must say that we never had such large support for these demands and for what we want to achieve than in this campaign. So we can f hear everywhere in Europe, and especially in certain parts of Eastern Europe, great concerns of uh, this transition, because people are faced with phase-out debates, but they are not confronted with phase-in debates. So if we say that decarbonization cannot lead to deindustrialization, then I'm not talking about overall EU27. I'm talking about these regions in Europe where for the moment only one industry 
whatever sector it is, is actually the predominant factor of employment. Well, if this sector is leaving because it has to phase out, and there is no debate about phase in, how would you react if you are faced with that reality in Bulgaria or in other parts of um, Europe and not only Eastern Europe? Yeah? So this is actually today the, the, the crucial point. And, and one uh, of the also declarations from uh, EU politicians in the last two, three years was that no one should be left behind. Yeah? I quote also uh, Thierry Breton, who I met on this case several times. He perfectly understands the reality. Um, he understands the risks here. Uh, and, and he also confirms that this, no one should be left behind it should not only remain a slogan, but should be put into practice. So in that sense, um, and I don't want to speak too long, the social dimension of the Green Deal and the climate law and the Fit for 55 package goes far beyond a skilling program. Uh, and the Pact for Skills at EU level is a good initiative, and we are fully involved in those sectors where we organize workers. And we are also recognized as an important partner, so we also thank the Commission for doing that. But it's going beyond skills, because you can skill people, you can upskill people. What, but what does it mean if you don't have new employment in the region where your job is disappearing? Um, do you know that, according to the United Nations, these are not my numbers, check it, uh, United Nations Global Overview, the 10 most depopulating countries in the world, 10 most depopulating countries in the world, nine of them are European. Bulgaria on top, Baltic States, Romania, uh, Croatia, uh, Mold Moldova also outside the EU. So um, nine of them are European. Yeah? So we are faced today already with a depopulation, with migration um, that is possible due to the, the single market and the freedom of movement, and that's good. But people are already today moving. Well, if this doesn't go right, if decarbonation is indeed, for certain regions, deindustrialization, then the migration and the depopulation in certain regions will just move forward and will go on. Bulgaria, I take that example again, to, to, currently more than 7 million, just a little bit more than 7 million uh, inhabitants. They came in 1991 when they um, became uh, uh, out of communism, they were with more than 9 million. Um, and the forecast by the United Nations is that they will just have a little bit more than 5 million inhabitants still in 2050. Well, uh, this cannot be the future of Europe, and this cannot be the result of decarbonization. So we need to um, combine skilling and upskilling with new investments, with a new uh, future for industrial regions where something new needs to be uh, created. And in that sense, um, this whole decarbonization agenda uh, which we fully support, I repeat, uh, has, a, has a major risk for the future of Europe. Uh, because if it doesn't go right, then we will face a reality where certain regions in Europe and certain countries in Europe will probably succeed in this transition. They will indeed skill people, there will be new jobs created, and people will move from one job to the other. Let's look to what's going on in Germany with the coal out, uh, exit, uh, the Kohlenausstieg what we see in the Nordic countries, we can expect that there, probably, this transition will move in the right direction. But with the same certainty, we, might, we can say today that if things are not changing in our view on this transition, that the um, transition in other parts of Europe will actually lead to deindustrialization and to um, social uh, issues and to social problems. And then the reality will be that this whole decarbonization agenda will not bring Europe together, but actually will widen Europe more than it is already widened today. So, and then um, I'm coming to my political point, and that is that uh, we are all faced today with um, scepticism uh, in Europe, and that leads to support for populism uh, and populist parties, extreme parties, and so on. Well, it it's can be expected that if this gr uh, Green Deal is not a real social deal and goes beyond energy poverty uh, debates, because that's now today the hot uh, uh, item, uh, energy poverty, and it's absolutely a, cr a crucial point, but it's not the only point, 
so if we don't succeed on that, then we might see uh, a more uh, uh, social gap in Europe and also risk for the political future of Europe if uh, certain regions are so disappointed, so dissatisfied about this transition that it didn't bring anything to them in their region. And if the only future is for their kids, um, uh, sons and daughters to move out of the region to find the future, if that is the result for certain regions, then we do have a political problem in the EU in, uh, in a few years' time, in 10, 20 years' time. And last point that I want to make on this point on social issues is that um, we urgently need the mapping. What does this transition now going to be for the regions? We don't have that today yet in detail. So we should work really more in detail, more in depth on the mapping of the employment consequences uh, of this uh, Green Deal and the climate law and the Fit for 55 package for certain regions. And then um, the involvement of all stakeholders is important. We are currently, and you mentioned it, Vincent, the territorial just transition um, plans are in debate. Yeah? Well, um, it's important, and I'm not, uh, it's not because I represent here the trade unions, but it's important to, to have the workers on board in these debates. From the beginning till the end, the trade unions on board, because then we see also ownership in the design of these just transition uh, regional plans. Uh, and they will uh, also be, um, yeah, it's important to have them on board to have this good social dialogue. Um, so that's actually all what I wanted to say because I can say much more, but I want to bring the debate that we had um, with the three first speakers, which was excellent and very much on what is the technological reality and what kind of energy policy do we need and so on. All important, but besides the technological challenges, don't forget the social challenges. And the social challenges are more than energy poverty, are more than skilling and upskilling and retraining. It's much more than that. And that also um, includes an important regional um, dimension, an important territorial dimension. And we can only succeed if we all uh, stick together. And if we manage this in, uh, in, in cooperation, in social dialogue as well. So, sorry that I um, was maybe a little bit too long in my presentation, but I think it's important to bring that dimension also into the debate. Thank you, Luke. The social and the people dimension is certainly you know, super important and equally in terms of climate change. When we look at climate change, if we don't deal with climate change, we're also going to have a huge social and people problem. Uh, so, Alain, you have the opportunity to say a couple more words if you would like, and if not, I will move things forward because uh, we're quite tight on time, but I don't want you to feel that you're not able to uh, add a few more words if you'd can, like to. We can move to the the discussion, question and answers. And, uh, We've covered a lot already on yes. the panel. Okay, so I would like to ask for the poll to be launched. There's a poll for all of you, and there's also a way for you to submit questions. I need to look over there for the people that are watching on the live stream. Um, there is a code uh, for Slido, uh, hashtag, so the code is 923686. If you're not familiar with Slido, it's a, a website or an application that you can get on your phone and you can therefore uh, ask questions uh, to the panel. We're going to also take questions from in the room and uh, there will be a poll uh, at some point coming up which we also invite you all to uh, take part in. Um, First of all, we have a microphone. I think we have a willing uh, volunteer from Sarah Muni to go around with a microphone and uh, see if anybody in the audience has a question uh, that they would like to, to put to us. And I see a hand there about halfway back in, on the left side. The microphones are up here, if anybody's willing to, uh, to run around like a masked person and ask questions. Um, can you please just say, uh, if you're asking a question, can you just say where you're from so that we all know, you know who we're talking to? And the poll is up for those of you that, sorry, just one second. The poll is up for those of you that would like to uh, have some input on the poll. What are the preconditions as indicated in the new roadmap for the ceramic industry to contribute to a resilient carbon neutral Europe by 2050? I don't think that's going to work for the live stream, so just give us a second. We don't want the people that are watching to be excluded. The challenge of having the hybrid event, but we'll make it work. If not, there's another mic here. 
just, uh, just a second. Are the speakers okay? Everybody okay on the panel? Yeah. If not, we'll inv I'll invite you to speak loudly and I'll try to repeat your question. So then do you please, no, for my sake, keep it short so I can repeat it. So energy prices, inflation, and is it taken into account by the Commission? I don't know, Vincent, if you can speak for the entire Commission, but maybe you can give a, you can give a go to answering the question. Indeed, it's a very critical issue. It's a very big question. Uh, and uh, probably, as you know, uh, it's at the top of the agenda of the Commission. And the commissioners, different commissioners, have already uh, spoken about uh, this, uh, this, uh, this issue. It's, uh, it's based on uh, this uh, surge of uh, energy price uh, occurred uh, just uh, not at the end of this uh, uh, COVID crisis, but uh, well, at, uh, when uh, the, the recovery was on the, on the way and due to, to several factors, and among them, of course, the surge of, uh, of demand of energy all over the world, it's a, it has a def, it a definitely a, a geopolitical dimension. So that's something which cannot be addressed uh, in one, in a, one uh, single uh, key measure or uh, uh, support scheme or whatever. Uh, as you probably know, uh, recently the Commission has released uh, EU toolbox in order to, to address, to, to, to monitor the, 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 this uh, energy price increase, and uh, of course, it's first of all it's dedicated to, to 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 member states, and it allows member states to 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 raise uh, support measures uh, to their industries and uh, to to citizens in order to cope with to face with the the, the, the surge of energy price. At the end, I would say a word: no one knows whether this uh, energy prices surge will last for long. It has a, it, this sudden, at a, such a high rate, this sudden uh, increase of energy rates was so quick that we can also imagine that it can that it goes down uh, very quickly. Uh, personally, I've experienced the crisis, the, the crisis of 2008 uh, in, in, in business. And I saw my market share de decreasing by 60 persons, my prices by 60 persons. So, and uh, we, we go through a few years like that. And when we re the recovery came, uh, prices goes uh, and activities goes, uh, goes, uh, goes up uh, very quickly too. Uh, so no one knows how the, the service goes, uh, will go. And uh, I will say, Speaking on behalf of the whole commission, I will say, please go to this uh, EU toolbox and see what, can, what, uh, what, what is, uh, is for is for C. I know that it's specifically dedicated, uh, focused on uh, mem EU member states' uh, potential actions. I hope it answers as wide as possible your question. Thank you, Vincent. I think as citizens, you always have the idea that prices only go up and that they never come down again. You might, uh, you might have that impression from some of the workers that you're talking with, uh, Luke. Uh, yeah. There's a fear about rising I think prices. Th this, what's happening now is uh, one of these examples where we say that the EU uh, must have a long-term strategy on how they have to deal with energy pricing in the future, because if this is going to be the reality in the future, then we have a huge problem. Yeah? Uh, so there needs to be action taken, uh, um, and also EU policy 
which for us means that you should maybe take action in a way that it's not all depending only anymore on market rules uh, in, uh, on energy pricing. So, um, okay, that's an ideological debate also on what does the EU have to do and where do they have to keep themselves out. Uh, but uh, I think uh, if we want to be um, yeah, secure of our energy supply in the future, then we need uh, to take more action ourselves and maybe also intervene in some uh, markets uh, such as energy pricing um, uh, so that we can avoid these volatile markets that we have today because um, I, I'm also very closely linked to one of the major chemical companies, BASF. Well, yeah, okay, uh, I know that uh, when they discuss today um, uh, investments, uh, they look a little bit to, uh, to, to security. Uh, and to price uh, security, well, uh, on this, at, at this moment, okay, there is a worldwide issue, but let's say that the EU must keep that better under control in the future. Um, and I'm not an expert on this field, so, uh, but it's clear that uh, we can't permit ourselves that this is going to, um, uh, to be a reality uh, in the future, because then we have a huge problem in our decarbonization agenda. And secondly, um, uh, I think the last number is that 3 million EU citizens have today already a problem in paying their energy bill. And this is going to be um, multi multiplied uh, in, the, in the next months. Eh? So there is, a, there is a social issue. That seems like the perfect point. If you can bring us Jorgos Atsimakakis, who's with us on the live stream, uh, if he's still uh, within reach of our technical wizards there. Uh, we're talking, um, I don't know if he's going to be able to be brought on, but he did say that they were looking at creating a market for, for hydrogen. Okay, no problem. Um, Alan, did you have anything you wanted to add on energy prices and stability? Um, and if not, well, I'll <coughs> go to the next Well, question. I'm not an expert on energy. Uh, I can just uh, <laughs> make the same, uh, the same uh, observation that this, 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 this energy costs right now are not sustainable. Um, and if uh, the volatility of the price is also a big issue, I can only uh, add on what, what uh, Luc said. Um, it's also an ideological debate. I was, uh, I'm, I'm somebody, sorry for that, but I'm not sorry because that's what I think. I think that energy is so critical that it should be uh, addressed uh, not only by market rules, but by, by um, a more institutional uh, way. I cannot define how, because it's so critical that it, it, it should be like this. This is detrimental. It, it can kill, uh, well, okay, I don't want Thank to, you. Uh, I don't, but uh, <laughs> a, a debate for uh, the debundling, day, in my opinion, was a big mistake, but yeah. I stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. So um, we have a microphone that's agree. working. So if, does anyone else have a question? There's a lady at the back, and then we'll go to the results of the poll. After this question, we'll go to the results of the poll, please. Thank please you. Please go ahead. Um, my name is Mara Caboara, Secretary General of EXCA. I have a question for Luc uh, Triangle. Um, I, I was struck in your excellent presentation that you also picked on many comments made the previous day by Haimo Choi, and I think uh, when I see uh, what you care about and what our industry care about, which is also the local values, workers at local level, and how we can collaborate together. I was wondering if this is not pointing out also in the direction of maybe some regional or local um, cooperation at, uh, between uh, uh, industry clusters, us, uh, workers, and if this could not be a way forward also for a more proactive um, uh, response to, to the, the crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Um, you referred to my excellent presentation, but I think this is an excellent question. Um, no, I think it's absolutely crucial uh, that, we, um, um, that we understand the, word, the meaning of the word anticipation. We all discussed today here the future. We know that the future will be different than what we have today. And that's in, that includes also impact on people, on workers. So, and my question to you, to industrialists, is what are you doing today to anticipate your workforce uh, for the competences and the needs that you will have in the future? And I understood very well what Vincent said, and he's right. We have to make our industry attractive for the young people of the future, but it's not enough. 
because we also need to make our industry prepared for the workforce that we have today. Uh, people that are 40 years old, uh, they need to be trained, retrained, because they still have a career of 25 years ahead of them. We can not only focus on the needs of young, of, or on the competences of young people that have to enter our industries, we also have to anticipate on the needs of the workers that we have today in our company so that we can prepare them for the competences of tomorrow. So this anticipation uh, issue is important and that's for us. And when you say anticipation, um, uh, needs uh, to have um, all the stakeholders on board. Um, and that's why this uh, regional uh, just transition plans which are currently in development in certain regions in Europe which are immediately already hit, for instance, by the coal phase out, uh, why it's so important that you have everyone on board. Um, maybe you missed it, and, um, uh, but a few weeks ago there was a demonstration in Sofia by coal miners, uh, but not only by coal miners, also by the local mayors, by the families, the whole community moved to Sofia and they went with a few thousands of people to ask uh, really involvement in the design of the future of their region because uh, this is going to be crucial if we think we can only leave that over to companies or to industrialists or to politicians it will never work we need to bring all actors together and put it really on the table and discuss what are we going to do here and how are we going to create a future with quality jobs in this region for the people that are going to be here in 10 years in 20 years time for young people to avoid that the only alternative we offer them is please you can do your education here but if you want to if you want to find a quality job you will have to move to somewhere else outside your country or at least outside your region and that's really not the EU that should not be the future of the EU we should be able to create a future for everyone in the region where they are born and where they want to live. Uh, and that's the, going to be the major challenge, believe me, that's going to be the major challenge. And again, if we fail, we have a political issue. Thank you. Any, any other speakers want to add anything to those comments? And if not, we'll go to the poll well, results. We have a bitter experience here in Northern Europe when we close the coal mines and the steel mills. Uh, I think this, this, these ones are still not totally uh, healed. Uh, I think we should maybe uh, learn from, from this uh, past experience. Hmm? Okay. Give you the chance now. Um, could we please have the results of the poll? Hopefully you've been able to vote and our online viewers have been able to vote. So access to carbon neutral fuels at affordable prices is a, is a clear winner. I guess you could vote for more than one because they, the journalist in me says they don't add up to 100. But the clear winner is uh, access to carbon neutral fuels um, as a precondition. And then stable regulatory framework. Uh, skilled workforce, Luke, 20% uh, thought that the skilled workforce was really key. And I'm sure that Sarah Muni will be uh, sharing and tweeting the poll results. Uh, we're quite tight on time, so I think we're going to have to close this first panel unless somebody is absolutely burning with a question. All right, then I'd like to thank our speakers and uh, please stay with us for the second panel. Thank you.
on the, the next slide uh, goes beyond emissions. Uh, because, as we know, the Green Deal uh, tackles much more than that. And this slide is more about uh, resource, all other resources, and partly uh, raw materials. Um, the, the chart on, on the left shows that uh, since uh, 1960, the amount of refractory material consumed per ton of crude steel produce has been divided by five. We are constantly working uh, to uh, reduce our own business somehow. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge for the industry, but it's a nice challenge to have in, uh, uh, to, to face, to, to be a great contributor to the Green Deal. We would like also, obviously, to uh, reuse as much as we can of, uh, of these materials. And on uh, the pie chart on, on the right, you, you can see that it's already largely done, not always extracting all the values that could be extracted from these materials, which is uh, one, one of the key ch challenges we had. There, there was a question earlier today about um, secondary raw material. We prefer to talk about secondary raw materials and waste because there is a lot of value in, in them. And uh, we, as a PRE executive committee, we had a meeting with uh, DG Environment uh, yesterday uh, to uh, precisely di discuss this and highlight all the difficulties we, we face in this respect. <clears throat> Getting back into, into steel on the next slide, um, Vincent Basuyo showed us uh, on his chart that uh, yes, we want to reduce emissions, but we want to grow GDP, we want growth. And it's true, we will not achieve our objectives without growth. Um, still has always been historically a key element of growth. To, uh, it's essential uh, to grow the economy, it's essential to grow uh, the, green, uh, the green energies uh, without still no windmills, without still no uh, hydrogen uh, consumption or circulations and, uh, and all type of applications. On the next slide, we will have a look at the challenges that face the steel industry because the steel industry is a larger emitter of, of, of CO2, 8% uh, of, uh, of total emissions. So contributing to reduce emissions for, for the steel industry, which is our mission, is a key element of meeting our, our global challenges. And I will uh, conclude uh, on, uh, I have a, on the next slide, please. Um, not yet the conclusions, the next. Um, on, it, it also goes through innovation. Uh, we, um, we need new refractories, new developments, uh, to uh, allow the steel industry uh, to reduce its own emissions. It is true, obviously, for direct reduction or the electric half furnace uh, production, but it is also true for new processes that will, in the future, hopefully replace blast furnace, which are highly energy in intensive. So as re refractory makers, we are also very working very hard to increase our R&D and, uh, and meet this, this, uh, this new and exciting challenge. As a conclusion, on the next slide, <coughs> our mission is to help humanity reach the Green Deal. We do it by uh, reducing emissions of uh, heat, of uh, reducing the exposure to hot metal. We doing, do it by reducing the consumption of refractory material because our materials are more and more uh, resistant. Uh, we do it by reducing the CO2 emissions per ton of steel produced. And we do it by reducing the weight of metal parts in vehicles. 
Thank you. Our next speaker joins us on the live stream, Doris Schrucker. She's head of unit in DG Research and Innovation. Welcome, Doris. And Doris is heading the unit for industrial research, innovation, and investment agendas in the Directorate for Prosperity. That sounds like a, a wonderful mission to have, uh, to be working on prosperity in an industrial context. Uh, Doris, you have uh, the floor for 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a sign if the time starts to um, t starts to get a bit tight. Over okay. To you. Th thank thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this welcome. Pleasure to be here. Um, the occasion is the launch of a, a new roadmap for the ceramics industry. That is always a challenge to look ahead and uh, and even to be committed. That is something which the public and certainly from our side uh, also. Um, we, we we would expect and hope uh, and our mission is uh, to to help the industry and to support the activities in research and innovation which help uh, in the transition uh, towards uh, the, the the climate objectives the green deal the circular economy but you mentioned prosperity as well the, the background of my directorate here um, it is also about uh, the, the people who benefit from, uh, from from the products and services the industry can offer but also those who work in the industry. So um, if we look back the past uh, two weeks, COP26 has certainly confirmed again that it is not only important, but also very urgent uh, to do something and to reduce the climate emissions to re still reach uh, the, the goal of maximum 1.5 uh, degrees in, in, in global temperature rises. Uh, and there are many other challenges as well ahead, like uh, climate adaptation, the resources, dealing with waste, uh, dealing with energy uh, and, and pollution, which we also need to address. And uh, the ceramics industry, like other energy intensive industries, it's, it's, it's coming all together. And, and our job is uh, to, uh, to, to help uh, with this. And as we're using public money as well, to, uh, to manage uh, the funds we get entrusted uh, with, the, with the biggest effectiveness. And uh, this is certainly that we want to see results, that we want to contribute to these transitions uh, which are now ahead. That is certainly something uh, which is characterizing our cooperation with industry uh, on uh, in the new framework program Horizon uh, Europe. It is the biggest program of its kind in total 95 and a half billion over seven years, of which 35% will be dedicated uh, to climate action. And we pursue also very actively the goals of the uh, circular economy. Um, we work together with industry. Uh, partnerships are a key element of uh, implementing uh, this program. And uh, the, the idea is to accelerate the developments and to achieve tangible results, which contribute then to the emission reductions which we need and to the transformation to a circular economy. Uh, by now, we launched uh, 11 partnerships uh, in cooperation with the industry together for a total investment of 22 billion euros until 2027. And Horizon Europe, the program will contribute and support to them, support them in the order of 8 billion euros. The ceramics industry is one of 10 energy intensive sectors who work together and uh, get support in the partnership processes for planet with a total investment volume of 2.6 billion euros, half of which is uh, uh, public support and half of which is investment by industry. And we hope that the impact of the activities goes also beyond uh, these projects. We see that already that we have a, a can expect and hope to get a higher leverage. The partnerships 
pool resources across sectors and they involve large industry, SMEs, research organizations and universities uh, to implement a common strategic research and innovation agenda, which also looks beyond in the, in the tam same time horizon, 2030 and 2050. And that is the same for other partnerships as well with industry, such as clean steel, the circular bio-based Europe, hydrogen or batteries, or a human built environment, uh, which deals with energy efficiency buildings. Most of these partnerships target directly emission reductions and the transformation to a circular economy um, and they are set up to achieve tangible results and impact. Uh, you will see that if you read also the, the, the strategic research and innovation agenda. Uh, we have other mechanisms as well, a new instrument like missions, where we aim at very concrete uh, goals also of societal relevance, like 100 climate neutral cities, just to mention that one. Um, we don't start from scratch. We've had a partnership already under the previous framework program and new projects are uh, to tackle climate change uh, and the circular economy are just starting following a 1 billion Green Deal call in 2020 last year. In Processes for Planet, the new partnership, we put emphasis on technologies and solutions which apply to more than one sector or which connect different sectors when this offers new improvement potential. And, and here industrial symbiosis is certainly something which, uh, which appeals uh, to, to you as well. And we aim at building circularity hubs where we can show that it is possible to decarbonize industrial processes and to implement at the same time circular economy approaches um, to reuse waste or gases uh, and to connect also to the to cities or to other uh, to the neighborhood in, in, in regions. Our support goes beyond the funding as well because we connect as well very actively research and innovation to other policies and uh, the aim is to achieve synergies as well between different support strategies and program at European level, but also with, with the member states. If you look at the updated industrial strategy, you find that it is an innovation strategy at its heart, and energy intensive industries are identified there as one of 14 European ecosystems. And we are just developing a new policy tool as well, which should strengthen the link from research and innovation towards the industrial strategy, which is common industrial technology roadmaps. We have two under preparation at the moment, one on low carbon technologies for energy intensive industries, another one uh, on uh, in circular industrial technologies uh, for energy intensive industries, construction and textiles. And the new element is that we that it is on, on the one side, it is about creating a pipeline for research and innovation from basic research to deployment. But we give emphasis to what needs to happen to go from that stage where we can still give support towards deployment, towards the industrial strategy. And how does this fit with the priorities which the member states set in line with the European Green Deal, for example? Um, and how can we um, link different investment agendas and instruments so that we create an environment which is conducive and supports these uh, ambitious emission reductions which we need to achieve. So talking about synergies, we see links from Horizon, the research program, for example, to the Innovation Fund. That is an instrument which is, which, uh, is, is more downstream uh, for support to uh, also innovative uh, technologies. Um, the Invest EU program managed by the European Investment Bank and the Investment Fund will also support industrial transition and energy intensive industries with a focus on research and innovation and uh, new solutions. The Trust Transition Fund will intervene and support regions and industries which are particularly concerned by phasing out of fossil fuels. And um, in the recovery and resilience plans of the EU member states, which are now front loading as well, um, means to 
not only to recover and not to create recreate business as usual but really to get the transitions going and uh, and innovation going we see about 200, 200 billion euros for the green transition reserved you know 37 percent um where uh, the commission asked to, to invest into into the green transition also, the state aid framework, which is currently under review, will look for a coherent approach across different instruments with the means while, while preserving competition. So on our side, we try really to provide the support which would enable the industry to, to do your job. What we you, you expect that as well, what we expect in return is as well that uh, you invest just talking about the partnership, for example, we invest the co-investments from the industry side, complementing the 1.3 billion, which would come from uh, Horizon Europe. And we, we think that we can go far. We see the results from uh, previous research and innovation. The previous partnership uh, has delivered concrete results for emission reduction. We exceeded the, tar the targets uh, for reducing dependencies on fossil fuel energy. Energy, uh, reduced waste by more than 40%. So there are solutions, there are showcases which we would very much like to continue. And we have seen as well that SMEs who participate in research and innovation here tend to outperform others. So that is an excellent basis to continue. And I need to add here that with the work on the technology roadmaps, uh, our intention and certain concerns are also directed to what happens now until 2030, because the reduction curve needs to be quite steep overall. And we need to see as well how uh, energy intensive industries can contribute here already while at the same time we know that much half and, and and maybe even more of the reductions by 2050 will come from technologies which are still under development uh, so here we also look at solutions to fund and to finance uh, results and and work with the partnership not only forward looking what needs to be done but also what can we do with results now, the ceramics industry is a world leader with a large export record and global competition. Europe is a front runner in green technologies and we want to stay that. Um, so this is why uh, investments in R&I are really important at this stage and nobody can uh, get the full impact on their own. So this is why we really bet on cooperation and uh, look forward to working with the industry on ambitious projects in the partnership. Thank you. The panel discussion if you're able to join us then. So thank you very much. Could we have our next, thank you. Could we get the next speaker onto the screen please? Our next speaker is uh, Professor Alexander Michaelis. He joins us from Germany. He's the uh, president of the Fraunhofer Institute for Ceramic Technologies and Systems in Dresden, and he's a full professor for ceramics at the University of Dresden. So clearly a big expert on ceramics. I'm afraid you only have 10 minutes and I will start giving you a sign if, uh, when you're getting close. Uh, so uh, Professor Michaelis, over to you. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. I really regret that I cannot be in Brussels right now, but I think meanwhile, we know how these hybrid meetings work. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about the meaning of ceramics. And uh, as already was mentioned by the pre-speakers, of course, ceramics industry uh, needs a lot of energy due, due to the thermal processing involved, and that results in a relatively high CO2 uh, output. So right now there are still a lot of exemptions from the emission trading systems, CO2 certificates. Um, but in the future this will become more and more of an issue and I know a lot of industries that are concerned about this and that are thinking about moving outside of the European Union and that of course would cause a problem. And the, not only because of the figures, so the ceramics industry is a relatively small industry. When I look into the German figures, so we roughly have 
30,000 employees and working in the field of ceramics, 200 companies, basically SMEs, turnover of 5 billion Europe. That might be below the border of awareness of uh, conventional politicians, but it doesn't reflect the meaning of ceramics for the future energy transition. And this is the, the point um, I want to make. Ceramics have a unique scope of properties. So they are um, have an extremely high robustness versus uh, harsh environments. And this is exactly what we need when we develop new technologies for, for the Green Deal and, and for the energy transition and for a hydrogen economy. And this is a point that we have to, to make and to explain to politicians. So steel was already mentioned. So steel is, everybody's aware how important steel is. Also polymers, everybody has an idea what a polymer is, but not everybody has an idea what ceramics is. Ceramics, people think about uh, coffee pots or toilet pots or things of this nature, but due to the unique properties of these materials, they are needed as an enabling technology for all kinds of uh, high-tech applications. And that's the reason why we really need ceramic technology to be successful in the Green Deal. And uh, I just want to give one example. And for this, I would like to use this one slide you see now on the, on the right side here. And here you see one um, upper elevation SOE. This stands for solid oxide electrolysis. Um, you might know that when we talk about hydrogen, we need green hydrogen, gray hydrogen, or other hydro types of hydrogen uh, produced by, by using hydrocarbon fuel will not help uh, diminishing the CO2 output. But electrolysis using renewable energy, that can help. And for this, you need electrolysis technologies. And one of the most important electrolysis technology is this SOE technology. It's a ceramic-based technology consisting of ceramic materials and uh, this technology has a 30% higher efficiency in the power to hydrogen conversion than any other competing technology. There's also alkaline technology. There's another kind of fuel cell technology that can be applied. But this technology has a 30% higher efficiency, which is a tremendous uh, benefit here. There's another advantage of this technology. It can not only convert water into hydrogen, green hydrogen, but it also can convert CO2 into CO. That means it's co-electrolysis capable. And this combination of CO and H2 is called synthesis gas. And this gas is needed for all kinds of power to X technologies. In this slide, it's combined with Fischer-Tropsch. And uh, with Fischer-Tropsch, you can make e-kerosene, e-fuels for, for airplanes, for ships, things of this nature. And only this technology is predestined to, to cope with with the needs that we have here. Another example is um, that by means of this SOE technology, you can generate hydrogen for the Haber-Bosch process. Maybe some of you are familiar with Haber-Bosch. In my opinion, this is the most important process ever invented in humankind, because by this process, by means of hydrogen and the nitrogen in the air, ammonia is produced. And this ammonia is needed to make a nitrite fertilizer and half of humankind is feeded by this process. We only would be able to feed 5 billion people. By means of this process, we can feed the 8 billion people that we have right now. But currently, the Saba Bosch process uses hydrogen made from hydrocarbon fuels, and there's a huge CO2 output resulting. If you combine this process with ceramic SOE technology, you can completely get rid of the CO2 and uh, save much more CO2 than, for example, Germany is creating in the whole year. And uh, this again shows it doesn't make sense to reduce CO2 output locally and preventing technology from, be, from, from being developed. It's more important to develop technology, export them on a global base, and then much more impact can be done. And another benefit of this ammonia that can be produced by Harbour Bosch is that ammonia is an ideal hydrogen carrier. So once we have hydrogen and you produce this centralized, the transport of the hydrogen will become a tremendous issue. And I think it doesn't make sense to, uh, to transport hydrogen itself 
but to transport something like a hydrogen carrier as ammonia, NH3, the carbon-free hydrogen carrier really makes sense for our future hydrogen economy. And here again, ceramic materials plays an important role. Also, the, um, uh, the, uh, the question that you asked in the, in the previous section, what is essential for the future CO2 reduction is the availability of hydrogen. And in order to make hydrogen available, it's very important to apply ceramic materials that can cope with these harsh environments with these new technologies that are used here. Other means here, like turquoise uh, hydrogen, are mentioned here, also in high temperature process requiring a lot of ceramic materials. And I think this is the most important message I want to, to make here. There will be no energy trans transition, in the energy transition. There will be no green deal and there will be no hydrogen economy without ceramics. And this is something I think we have to explain to politicians and also to the to, to the public, how important this technology is for these new technologies. And here we are still leading in Europe, but right now it's in danger that we So I saw that the, the, my mic was, was off for certain times. Did you hear uh, <laughs> the, something? Can you still hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you again. Okay, perfect. A minute to, uh, to wrap but up. There was a problem with the microphone. Give it a try. We still hear you. Okay. So uh, I'm done. I do not know whether you heard my last messages. <laughs> Maybe just go back 10 seconds and, uh, and recap your last message. We just lost you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I thought I got a message that the, the microphone was turned off. Uh, the message is that um, ceramic materials are needed to develop the technologies for a successful energy transition and hydrogen economy. Without ceramics, you will not be able to do this. And this is something we have to explain to the public and also to the politicians. Uh, the CO2 output generated by ceramics industry has no meaning compared to what we can achieve applying ceramic materials to these technologies. And this is, I think, the essential message. We need ceramics and we are right now still leading in Europe in this technology and we have to uh, yeah, protect this leading position by supporting ceramics industry to be successful in these technologies. It's a very bold message and a very clear message that you're sharing that without ceramics there will not be an energy transition and there will not be a green deal. So we can confirm that we heard your message loud and clear and I hope that you stay with us for another 10 minutes or so and then we'll have a uh, Q&A panel. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michaelis. All right, and our next speaker joins us in the room from Spain, Miguel uh, Munyar, who's from uh, Roca Group and is also the president of the uh, FESC Group. You're uh, Senior Managing Director at Roca. So, uh, Miguel, over to you. Federation of the Federation of the European Sanitary Work Producers. No? My colleagues in the previous panel and also in this, in the, in this panel also have tackled many, many other aspects because it's very complex, the, the, what we are talking about today, energy, CO2, etc., innovation, etc., hydrogen. But I will refer just to the ceramic construction, no? the materials in the, in the Green Deal. No? It's what, um, what we understand mostly, as said uh, previously, the, the, the other person, no? that uh, we believe that uh, in ceramics mostly is for the construction, but there are many other uh, solutions or technical high-tech uh, products, etc., that, that can be done with, with, with this. If you can, next slide, please. Well, 
we need to say that uh, we start that uh, talking about clay. Mm -hmm. Clay is a kind of earth with some characteristic which is uh, soft when it's dry, when it's wet, sorry, and hard when it's dry. No? Afterwards can be shaped and then bake it and we have a lot of uh, solutions and different products. Ceramic construction materials are made from clay. Right? This is the important, the important characteristic and the start of everything. Clay is a widely available, easily accessible and recyclable natural raw material. Right? Also, the restoration of the clay pits when they happen after the reuse and the preservation of biodiversity is very easy to do, be done and in many places they are restored and converted into parks, etc. Is local production, this is very important, and also local employer, no? local customized products. No? But very is, everything is local and very, we don't need to move from one side to another. Low environmental impact. This is a very important characteristic also with uh, the, our materials, the, the ceramic. Next slide, please. If we refer to the construction, graphically you have here a representation of a house and I don't need to, to repeat all the, all the parts of the house, but if we start from the roof, of the, the, the floors, also the pipes in the evacuation, etc., the toilets or in the bathroom, kitchen, wall and floor tiles, and all the walls in the house. So we can see that although can be produced in wood, in other materials, the houses, and every day there are new technologies to, to do, but mostly the, in the house, the, the, the ceramic is present permanently. No? Next slide, please. And here, one of the, the most important characteristics of, of our products, no? the, the long-lasting and affordable. And affordable is another characteristic, affordable products. Eh? A brick house, mm, can, be an, can have an average of lifespan of more than 150 years, eh? the, the, the bricks. Ceramic tiles for flooring, we say here 50 years, but probably much more because we have many examples of floors that we recover and can be used, we would say, at least also 100 years. No? Clay pipes, we say here 150, but, but probably we have experiences and examples of uh, more years even. No? Expand the clay, use it in the buildings and infrastructures, has a, an ending life, no? non ending life, no? a never ending life. And sanitary wear, that all of you know, we change the toilet maybe every 20 years or 25 years, but uh, they can be used and in places where cannot change, you, you can see them, we say here 50 years, but with uh, the ceramic itself could be much more, much more longer. No? This is an important characteristic that I want to stress out in this presentation, no? the long lasting. No? Next slide, please. Also with the ceramic related to the construction, we must say that it's supporting the renovation wave, no? the energy saving potential, because if a house stays for 100, 150, 200 years, then we don't need to construct a new house because we have already this house and we can save no, all this energy to, to build another house. No? Durability and re uh, reuse the qualities no, of the ceramic construction materials have been known for centuries. No? The high level of safety in case of fire or floods is also a good characteristic that I think that uh, all of us can appreciate. And they also ensure a high indoor air quality as non-toxic emissions emanate from the building's fabric into the internal environment. Next slide. Please. So the contribution to the energy efficiency is clear. We have here some examples that can, I can mention, but here they are the, the representative of the, the other associations, but better maybe. But this, as a summary, we can say that clay brick, cavity walls, and monolithic clay block walls with integrated insulation ensure an efficient insulating of buildings. And we can see in many constructions as per today. No? Clay bricks are a cost-effective solution to treat thermal breaches. This is a, another big problem that has been solved in, in the last well, many years, but it's, it's a good solution. No? Ceramic roof tiles have a high thermal emittance and allow for natural, natural ventilation. This is also used in many, many buildings. And ventilating facades with the reduced dampness of walls and the ter formation of thermal breaches. No? This is very uh, the solutions that can be applied in lately in, in, in many in many buildings. No? Next slide, please. Another part 
that I can stress out is referring to the, 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 the toilets and all the effort that we have made inside the, the effects and also with the ceremony is to, to, to work in this direction there to find an unified water label. No? There is a lot of regulations. Each country has a different regulation, but we, we try to harmonize and to go in one direction. In Europe, nowadays, we have, let's say, two uh, water label, no? but, uh, the, the German site and, and the rest, but more or less the, the objective and what we want to achieve in the same, in the, both of them, are, are more or less the same. No? And before there is something mandatory, we are promoting and we have promoted this voluntary scheme, which is very, very uh, useful. No? Next slide. And also, I, we need to talk about the circular building ceramics. No, it's, I, I am not discovering anything new for all the audience, but you know that in a lot of places, the bricks are reused uh, to construct the houses, and every day, more and more, we are recovering and reutilizing all of this to, uh, to construct new, the new buildings. No? Bricks and roof tiles can be reused as such of newly built buildings, as said, and when ceramic construction materials cannot be reused, they can be recycled for a range of purposes. No? Many, many, many different solutions and many other industries, auxiliary or not auxiliary, or directly, they are using the, this, these materials. No? Next slide. And finally, I want to say that also Ceremony is an official partner of the new European Bauhaus Initiative, so in the working groups that we are there, because it's important that we participate in shaping the future of ways of living, living eh, according to the key principles of sustainability, inclusion, and quality of experience. Eh? And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. So that brings the end of our presentations. We're going to move into a Q&A phase. I just want to check uh, people who are on the live stream that are putting questions on Slido. Will we be able to see them on the screen? No. OK, so we're just going to take questions from the room, which means we're relying on the room for their questions. I have a few uh, up my sleeve as well, of course. Um, so we're talking about 2050. And for some people, that's really too far off. It's too hard to imagine. When I was preparing for this, I shocked myself to realize that in 2050, I'm going to be hopefully 74 if all goes well. So it's, it is a long way out and it's quite difficult to, uh, you know, to keep on track with these initiatives and we have you know, all the goodwill in the world to do things better, but we have to you know, really find a way to keep on track with these changes. Um, I want to see if anybody in the room already has a burning question, because if not, I'm just going to get started. But please prepare your questions and just give us a sign if you have a question that you'd like to, uh, to put to any of our panelists, including uh, Doris from the European Commission and uh, Professor Michaelis from, from the University of, of Dresden. Oh, that's wonderful. I can see the, the two participants that are here online, I don't know, uh, you, you guys can't see them, but we can see them. So we are joined as a panel. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask a question to, to Doris from the European Commission. If you've had chance to already look at the, at the roadmap, um, really, you know, how aligned are the European Union's priorities under Horizon Europe with the solutions that Ceremony has identified in the roadmap? Do you see some alignment or some parallels there? Uh, I would, the first thing I was looking at is where does Sierra Muni think the Xerox uh, industry will stand at, uh, at, uh, at 2050. And um, it was good to see that in principle a net zero was, uh, was aimed at. Um, what you see in the roadmap as well is how challenging it is for the industry. Um, and uh, that uh, there is a lot of different solutions which need to come together. And uh, you might want to look as well at the, at the reduction curve, which, 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 which you see. Um, I think, um, and that is also why we work closely with our partnership is that you need to have milestones on the way. Um, you know where you want and need to get by 2050. 
um, we know that we need uh, to have technologies which need to be ready by then. Um, there are dependencies as well. We, we see the dependency on uh, supply of clean energy, green energy, um, green hydrogen, um, that there are still process emissions where where, where, where we need to have negative uh, technologies. There are, there are risks around that, um, which, which however should not make us hesitate to go for it. So, so, so that, that, that's basically uh, the, the message that, uh, that we, need to, we need to continue. And we need, in, as a new aspect also in research is, we need to find ways of knowing faster what we can uh, implement and that we then also do that. And on our side, we are ready to have these discussions and to have that as part of that work. So you need to be aware of the risks, which you know, going into any transition, it's helpful to understand what the risks are. And it sounds like mm. we need to be ready to fail faster if things uh, are not going uh, as you wish. Yeah, and hopefully not, <laughs> because because uh, if we look at the at the at the transition needs, then there is not much uh, scope. Uh, and, 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 and there is no scope for delaying. So I think the coming decade, it will also be is, uh, essential to, to, to move on with the things we know and have already. Yeah, the coming decade will be essential. And it was mentioned in the previous panel that the investment cycles are you know, 20 years or more. And so we do need to move, uh, move quickly and move in a very you know, determined way. Thank you, uh, Ms. Schrocker. I'd like to come to Professor Michaelis because you hear that there's a very ambitious goal here. And you yourself said this transition is not doable without um, the ceramic industry. What you presented was quite technical you know it was, it was very interesting to see the different routes to hydrogen the different sort of chemical transitions that can be done i want to zoom out a little bit because you've got so much uh, experience of this sector and do you feel that the ceramic industry can deliver on what's needed for 2050 i'm deeply convinced that it can and uh, all the technologies are already available partly here. Now it's um, the, the task is to reduce costs of, of course and uh, to make progress in the engineering work and here of course we also need support in R&D um, also for the European commissions to apply these technological solutions which, which are already there and to, 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 uh, um, to lower the cost I think it's a clear roadmap that we are having right now and I don't see any alternatives if you really are serious with the energy transition and this hydrogen economy we need to do this and the, the, the dangerous thing I see right now I do not want to have a deja vu with other technical fields we were leading in Europe in the past for example from education I'm an electrochemist and I know 20 years ago, we were leading in the field of electrochemistry, including batteries. And then there was a decision, this is all economy, we don't need this. And then the battery revolution came, I would say, and we lost all these competencies and now we are catching up again. The same must not happen to ceramics. There are other examples. I also worked in the, in the microelectronics business. The last company we had in Europe working on DRAM, so on, on storage technology, went bankrupt and the European Commission did nothing against it and right now we see what is happening. We are in trouble again. And this is something which um, needs to be told also to the politicians. Ceramics is not only something which where we have a lot of employees and where we have some turnover, but it's an enabling technology. And uh, this is, it, unfortunately, it's complex. So I have to apologize for the technical <laughs> details. Yeah, but it is, it is, and it is, it's complex. But I have a lot of proof that the technological meaning of ceramics is completely underestimated right now. And this is something we have to 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 tell the politicians. And the ambition in Europe is strong. If we want to be, you know, the first continent to be carbon neutral and we hope that everyone else will get in line behind us so that's a really important message to our audience uh, in the room and at home and also to the commission so thank you professor um miguel i'm curious you talked about not just energy efficiency but also water efficiency and water is an important element also when we look at uh, climate and the environment uh, in europe and we're already seeing you know the floods and the fires that you you talked about um, 
What needs to be taken into account in the renovation wave if we look at water? Well, I think that um, all the industry can talk about my sector, for instance, put in an example of the water label. No? We need to, I need to remember that 25 years ago, for instance, when we flush a cistern for the toilet, it was 16, 20 liters each flush. Yes. So in all this time nowadays, with two, three liters, it's the same flush. And every day we need to account that is millions of flushes <laughs> because we flush two, three, four times per day each person. So in the, this I think that if we calculate the safe energy is very important. But this is a visible example, but there are many others in the use because we are talking in all the in industrial related to this in many many all the processes that we can save this the use of the water or reuse of the water is applied no? so at the end i don't have here the figures but the same that my colleague patrick has presented the the co2 in our industry all the steel the the difference are huge in different industries no in our we are um, because to obtain this the the, the question of the flashing it seems that it's something that we reduce the number of liters, but it's, it's not so easy. You know? It's a lot of innovation behind because there is the, the dynamics of uh, waters inside there, the traps, the diameters, etc., that to gain no, this speed in order to evacuate everything. So, and at the end, if today we are able to do the same and to launch the, 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 all the, the things outside the 10 meters to comply the rules, is because there is a lot of uh, research behind this, a lot of investment, and we will continue in doing in this way. No? Thank you. I mean, both you and Patrick are coming from European ceramic producing companies. And Patrick, I'd love to get your perspective as someone who knows the industry so well. How do you see the contribution that the ceramic industry can make towards a more sustainable and resilient Europe? It's for me or <laughs> for me. <laughs> We, we all, all the speakers have already t told it, and uh, the contribution of Professor Michaelis in this respect was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, ceramics are, are the art of, of industry. It was the first industry of the world, and uh, it's needed in everything we do, and it offers the solutions for the future. Uh, so we, um, whether we use them better, whether we use them to produce electricity, I, I would. I would go one um, one step beyond. I, I think the, the the challenge, and it's a very nice challenge, is for us to make the green deal an opportunity for our in industry. If Europe is in advance in going to carbon-free uh, economy, it means that the ceramic European ceramic industry will be in advance compared to what is happening in the world in the technology it offers for the future. So by contributing to the Green Deal as we do, we are also building our industry future. Amiga, what do you think? Is the industry ready for that challenge? Well, ready. It's uh, too much, maybe, to say. We are getting ready because it's a non-ending work, and I think that we will, we may achieve this. And there are a lot of problems, as I said, for many aspects from all the colleagues that in the other panels or even in this panel. Many challenges, but I think that not. I will not say ready, but we are working hard. All the sectors and going to in this direction, I, and I believe that uh, we may achieve these goals. Thank you. Let me come back to Professor Michaelis with a last question. If you could very, very shortly tell us what you think is maybe the most exciting innovation that we should be uh, looking to come out of the ceramic industry. Out in my presentation a little bit, I think it's electrolysis. So when we want to make green hydrogen, there's only one technology that can do this, it's electrolysis. And here, do you hear me? Or <laughs> also, uh, when it comes to hydrogen generation, we need this electrolysis technology, and here ceramics plays a major role. So if you want to make this efficient when it comes to renewable power, to hydrogen, we need ceramic components. Also when it comes to CO2 reduction, we need to separate the CO2 out of the air or out of uh, industrial exhaust. 
And here again, ceramic membranes play an important role. So this is very important. And the pre-speaker said, so ceramics is the oldest industry. That's true. But it's also the latest industry when it comes to technical ceramics. So the, the synthetic, well, ceramics based on synthetic materials were only invented 100 years ago. And here, uh, a lot of things still are under development. And this is something we have and it, the problem is it's diverse. So we have silicate ceramics on the one side, tiles, toilets, things of this nature, but we also have these high-tech applications. All the whole electronics world is a ceramics world. Yeah? And this is something we have to bring into the mind of the people because here I see a lot of things. When I talk to people, they always ask me, what is ceramics at all? Yeah? And this is something we have to explain. Yeah? And so thank you for bringing your enthusiasm into the room in Brussels, where we can also reach the, the policy making uh, audience. I think we will close it there unless anyone has a really uh, burning question, which I didn't see any hands go up before. I'd like to thank uh, all of our speakers, both in the room and uh, coming in from their home offices. The same for our audience in the room and everybody that's been uh, watching us. and. Um, then we have some questions. We are kind of out of time. Uh, when will the roadmap be available to the public? Ceremony, is it going on the website right away? Okay, it's available now. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't think we have the chance to go into those more detailed questions about the roadmap, but I would suggest that you send an email to Ceremony and I'm sure that somebody will be happy to follow up with you. And as for hydrogen, it's probably good to reach out to uh, Jorgo Schatzmakarkis at uh, the Hydrogen Europe. So um, enjoy reading the roadmap. Thank you all for your attention today. Thank you for the technical support. I know it's a big challenge uh, to do things in the room and online, and, and you guys have done a wonderful job, so thank you. And yeah, thanks to everybody. I'm Catherine Sheridan. I'm your moderator today, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>